God bless you so much. You may be seated. Now, this first session, before we go into our main preaching session, uh, a little bit before 11, uh, Chris is the Christian Life class, and we are dealing with things right now Christians need to know. There are some things that Christians really, really, really do need to know. They're not optional. And so the first of this, this is the third part of this lesson. We're talking about the doctrine of the oneness of God versus the doctrine of the Trinity. And um, if you were not here, did not hear the first two lessons that we gave on this, you sincerely uh, might want to either purchase the CDs or go online and uh, to our church website at, uh, and, uh, and bring yourself up to date. But we have been talking about that. Now, this is the last lesson that we're going to give on this subject in this series. We do come back here, amen, uh, uh, quite often. When I say quite often, I'm not going to say we do it every month or whatever, but, but we come back to this because this is fundamental. This is fundamental. The identity of Jesus Christ is the rock upon which he built his church, his identity. And so it's very, 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 very important. Now, I'm going to uh, pretend that everybody's up to date and up to speed, and we understand that to us there is but one God and his name one. And we know that the eternal God is a spirit and that he spoke everything into existence and that uh, the world and all things that are therein, he formed man in his image and man fell in the Garden of Eden based on the subtleties and the wiles of the devil through the serpent and that began the long, sad saga of the fall of mankind and God in his infinite mercy is is did not send another he robed himself in flesh in order to be the propitiation for our sins second Corinthians 519 to wit God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself amen We know that he spoke everything into existence. John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made which was made. God simply said, let there be light. And there it was. And that Word, that expression, amen, created. It wasn't another God. The Word was God. Amen. And then in in John 1 and 14, the Word expression of God became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the father and so he that was begotten through Mary the Bible says in verse 10 he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not and so when you see the man Christ Jesus amen you see God manifest in the flesh first Timothy 316 without controversy great is the mystery of godliness God was manifest in the flesh. Jehovah God took on human form. It behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. That's you and I. Amen. That he could be in all points tempted, just like we are, yet without sin. Amen. This is why Jesus said, Amen. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. He that hath seen, John 14, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. He said, The words that I speak, I speak not of myself, but or the works that I do, I do not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. And then in Colossians 2, 9, For in him, in Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you're complete in him, who's the head of all principality and power. Colossians 1.15, amen, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. So we understand that God is not made up of three persons 
and we went through the Athanasian Creed and, 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 and read it to you in its in confusing entirety uh, that says God is three persons. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, and that these, the Godhead is made up of three persons. And so oh, the question, of course, is, is Jesus one-third of the Godhead or is the Godhead in him? And the answer can only be given scripturally. And the scripture says, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you're complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. And this is why in Matthew 28, and we're getting to this in a few lessons, amen, this is why in Matthew 28, Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Go ye therefore, teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And he's got all power. And everywhere the apostles ever baptized, every single time, it was in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. For neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name, none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, if we're going to pray in Jesus' name, then we're going to baptize in Jesus' name. We're going to cast out devils in Jesus' name. We're going to baptize in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. If we're going to pray for the sick in Jesus' name, we're going to baptize in Jesus' name. Like they did in Acts 2.38, Acts 8.12, Acts uh, 10.46, and Acts 19.5 and 6. Everywhere you see the apostles baptizing, they always baptized in the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But the, the Trinity doctrine is that there are three persons in the Godhead. We do not believe that. There is one God. Now, he manifested himself as father of all creation. Amen. He became flesh. He became son for our redemption. And he pours out his spirit upon us for our gracious infilling and salvation power. Amen. But that doesn't mean there's three persons. It's God. Amen. Uh, just like you're a, you may, if you're here and you're, you're married, and you've got children, you're a son, somebody brought you here, amen, you're a father, and you're a husband, but there's not three of you, amen, I'm looking at Brother Mark Oliveira, and, and, and my eyes are playing tricks on me lately, but I still just see one of him, praise God, and that's all there ever will be, is one Mark Oliveira made like that guy right there, and he's a father, and he's a son, and he's a husband, and many other things, those are all titles, but his name is Mark Olvera. There's one God, and his name is? Amen. But there be, what I'm going to do today, we're going to talk about some things where, where people will want, if, if, they, if they believe that, they may throw this at you. They may throw this at you. And so I want you to be uh, up to date. So you want to take notes and think about this. Uh, first of all, they may take you to a place such as 2 Corinthians 1 and 2. Grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And they say, now look, right there's two. There's God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And they may take you to Ephesians 1 and 2. Amen. That states, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And they may take you to Philippians 1 and 2, where it's much the same. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So if somebody starts to, to, to play that with you, it's good that you know this. It's very, very good that you know this. First of all, in the Greek language, and we don't have to play Greek games to prove the oneness of the Godhead. Amen. Uh, but the word and, amen, is translated and, and it is also translated even. Now there are some others. But in the main, the word Greek word chi is translated and or even. And, um, and here in 1 Thessalonians 3.13, we read this. To the end, he, God, may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even, even, and that word is chi, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all saints. So here, that word and is translated even. And so you can read it usually either one or the other. 
to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. Now, sometimes you will find the phrase God and our Father, or here God, even our Father. It's what the King James translators did. So that's an example where you see that word translated as even. Also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 16, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and given us an everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Uh, and, and, and the reason the Greek language is, is so interwoven and overlays each other that one word as, is in the English language and its syntax, etc., will lend itself to the, to the best and most probable translation of, say, the word like Kai. And so, and hath given us hope, consolation, and good hope through grace. It's better there, and, and there's no problem with this, and. But you can, again, take it back and forth. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself, even God, even our Father, which hath loved us, and is better than even, given us everlasting consolation, and good hope through grace. But these here, it's a different syntax, and Joel knows the Greek language better than I do, and he could probably talk in more intelligently about it. We took, we took some classes together, and he caught it, and I didn't. Praise God. Or he caught more than I did. Let's put it that way. In fact, much more. In fact, I quit, and he kept going. So there you are. Um, but at any rate, <coughs> uh, here is a classic case where you see the word Kai translated as even. So so don't get uptight if somebody gives you that business. Amen. Uh, in 1 Peter 1, verses 1 through 3, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus. Now, does that mean there's two Simon Peters? Obviously not. It, he's a servant and he's an apostle. Amen. He's father and he's son. Amen. So a servant and or even an apostle of Jesus Christ. To them that have attained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Through the righteousness of God and our Savior. The righteousness of God even our Savior Jesus Christ. Okay. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and or even of Jesus Christ our Lord. And notice this, very important, according as his divine power, not their. Not their divine power. His is singular. His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him, not them, that hath called us to glory and virtue. Amen. So understand that don't be afraid of, of any phraseology like that. It's not there to obfuscate or to make it complicated. In reality, it is there to enlighten because all that uh, is is delineating the fact of what God did. He became flesh and dwelt among us. And I'm glad that he became flesh and dwelt among us. He did not send another. He robed himself in flesh in order to be the propitiation for our sins. Amen. And if we have to go a little longer today, I'm, I've got to finish this lesson, and I'm, so I'm going to try and speed it up. Uh, Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And so said, well, see, it's too, well, who's appearing? When the eastern sky, when he comes in the eastern sky, and we see the appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, you're not going to see a father and a son. You're going to see our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, and then in Titus 3 and 4, 
But after that the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appear. Here, amen, there is no Kai. He just said it the way it, it, it is without the delineation of the propitiation of what he did. He's covered it with the word Savior. The kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. And this is again why in Isaiah 43.11... He said, I, even I, am the Lord. I, even I, am Jehovah. Beside me there is no Savior. And in chapter 45, Look unto me, and be ye saved. For I am God, and there is none else, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. So He is our great God and Savior. Amen? And then in Jude 25, and we've showed this every week, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. There is only one wise God, our Savior. Amen. To our great God and Savior. Amen. So, don't let somebody stumble you up over something as simple as that. Notice this. 1 Thessalonians 3.11 now God himself and our Father. Here they did not put even our Father. They, the King James kept it and. So take him there and say now. Here it says now God himself and our Father. Does that mean that God is something and the Father is something else? If they want to play that game in Philippians 1 and 2, let's play that game right here. If you say that means two, then that means he, God, is separate from the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's try this. Now God himself, even our Father, even our Lord Jesus Christ, direct our way unto you. The Word of God's beautiful. It's beautiful to me. Amen. Then Colossians 3.17, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. That's not a confusing verse. That's a delineating verse. That is a verse showing the beauty. Amen. That this great universal Lord God Almighty, omnipotent that reigneth. Hallelujah. He loved us so much. He robed himself in human flesh. And he came and lived in this earth. And I give thanks, amen, unto that great God. Because he's our great God and Savior. Hallelujah. He's our great God and Savior. That's not, that's not an, an obscuring verse. That's a revelatory verse. Amen. We give thanks to God and the Father by Jesus Christ. When you thank Jesus, you are thanking the Father. He said, Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So when you thank Him, you're thanking the Father. Amen. So, then Colossians 2 and 2 that their hearts might be comforted, and then we go down, unto and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Amen. So don't let anybody play the word games of the word and understand the word is chi. It can mean even, and even if it says and, it's, it's, it's not a hurdle. It's not a hurdle. It's revelatory. Amen. The acknowledgement of the mystery of God and the Father and of Christ, of God, even of the Father, even of Christ. Amen. It's all one in the same via manifestation. Now, sometimes they may want to bring up to you this. They say, well, what about when John the Baptist baptized Jesus? We see the Trinity there. This is, this is, this is old hat. In fact, as I made mention to you, and I've heard this from the earliest days when I got in church and I began to talk to people about the oneness of God, they would take me to the baptism of Jesus. And I thought it so interesting in the book that I showed you last week written by William Penn in the 1600s, and the book I have was published in 1788. Uh, he brought up back then the baptism of Jesus because that's what Trinitarians were saying back then. And so he, he demolished it, and hopefully we will. All right? Matthew three sixteen and seventeen, the baptism of Jesus, and some of them. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, 
And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending uh, like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. All right? And so Trinitarians will say, Now, here's Jesus. That's one person. And uh, the Spirit of God descending like a dove. So there's the Holy Ghost. That's the person of the Holy Ghost. And the voice from heaven is the voice of the Father. And they say, there you got the Trinity right in front of your face. There's the Son, there's the Holy Spirit, and the voice of heaven of the Father. And they say, there's the Trinity. Well, first of all, hi, son. Hi, Sister Booker. And if somebody sends my parents a CD, hi, Mom and Dad. Amen. I'm talking to my parents, to my son, to my wife. I'm a son, I'm a father, I'm a husband. There ain't three men. And guess what? I can do more than one thing at once. And I'm a man. And God is God. All right? Let's take a close look at this. Number one, this is the voice from heaven that said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, I know, well, obviously, there we go. God's a spirit. I got my hand up my sleeve. Nobody can see it. Unless they look right up. And, and he cannot die. He cannot bleed. He cannot be tempted. God's a spirit. And so he overshadowed Mary. And in her womb, a son is conceived. And then a child was born. Amen. And at the baptism of John, the Spirit of Almighty God said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Is he well pleased with the humanity? Obviously. But I think you can take it a step further. In whom I am well pleased. It pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And he said, The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. And I do always those things that please him. Amen. And so the dove, as a symbol of the Spirit of God, was a sign to John the Baptist. John the Baptist, okay? Uh, This here, and we're going to show you, he saw the Spirit of God, is John the Baptist. All right? Because in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 32 and 33, and John, John the Baptist, bear record saying, I saw... Nobody else saw. I saw. He's the one that saw it. The Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So here's John the Baptist over here. He knows he's the forerunner of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so the Spirit of God, who's everywhere and can do everything, he was in Christ and he was taking care of Pluto, praise God. He was in Christ and he was making sure that the earth was keeping to its circuit. And all of that. And so he says, now John, upon whom you see the Spirit descending like a dove, you're going to know that's him. That baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Now that's interesting. Amen. So, so let's 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 take let's take this to our Trinitarian friend, and I mean that you, you, we, we're not trying to be ugly, we're, but but okay. So there's the Father, there's the Son, there's the Spirit of God. But don't you think that the Spirit of God, if it's a separate person, can take care of baptizing people on His own and doesn't need any help? Because if it's co-equal, co-eternal, they all have the same power then why does he need Jesus' help to baptize anybody with his spirit? Some good questions to ask Trinitarians. But it says that Jesus is the one that's going to baptize with the Holy Ghost. He's the one that gives the Holy Ghost. How's this work? Jesus said in Matthew 11, or excuse me, let's go back, John 3.11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me, Jesus, is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He 
shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus is the one that's going to baptize us with the Holy Ghost. So the second person is going to make the third person do something or help the third person do something or instruct the third person how to do it or something if there's a trinity. All right? But John 14, 17, and 18, Jesus said that he's talking about the spirit of truth, the comforter of the Holy Ghost that was coming, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. This is referring to the Holy Ghost as the spirit of truth. But Jesus said, but you know him. You know the spirit of truth for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Well, when he's speaking, he dwells with you. Uh, it's Jesus. Who was dwelling with him? It was Jesus. And shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I will come. To, I'm the one that's coming to you. So if, if the Holy Ghost is coming to us, the Spirit of truth, but Jesus said, I'm the Spirit of truth. I'm the one that's coming to you. And John the Baptist said, he's the one that's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. How does that work? No. God's a spirit. He overshadowed Mary. She brought forth a son. The son said, I dwelleth with you, but I'm going to be in you. Because he was God manifest in the flesh. And the flesh died. The spirit reentered it, glorified it. One sitting on the throne. And guess what? He's pouring out His Spirit. And guess who it is? It's Him. It's Jesus in our hearts. One great, gracious, almighty God. All the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are, are titles. They're not names. They're not persons. They're just titles. Like, I'm a father. I'm a son. I'm a husband. Amen. And I, I treat my son different than I do my wife, different than I do my parents. Amen. But there's just one of me. And so... As Father, He did thus and so. As Son, He does thus and so. As Holy Ghost, He does thus and so. But there's one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Here's some more questions for Trinitarians that you can bring up to them. Amen. When, and we've given this before, but when people are delivered up before the councils, who's going to help them speak? All right? In Matthew 10, 19, and 20, Jesus said, But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what ye shall speak, for it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. It's the Spirit of your Father. Don't get up tight if you're delivered up before councils. What you're going to say? Because the Spirit of your Father is going to tell you exactly what to say. Amen. All right, but then in Mark 13 and 11, it says, But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak. Now we've already heard in Matthew that it's your Father that's going to speak. And here in Mark 13, 11, it says, It's not ye that shall speak, but the Holy Ghost. So if there's three separate persons, it's not the... Matthew says the Father is going to speak. But Mark says it's the third person of the Godhead that's going to speak. The Holy Ghost is going to speak. Okay? Then you go to Luke 21, verses 14 and 15. Jesus said, Settle it therefore in your heart not to meditate before what ye shall answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries should not be able to gain, say, nor resist. So in Luke 21, it says the Son is going to speak. Amen. In Mark 13, it says the, the uh, Holy Ghost is going to speak. And in Matthew, it says, Matthew 10, it says that the Father is going to speak. So you take a, a, a Trinitarian person there, and you say, so I've got three persons in me. The Father is going to speak. If the Son is going to speak, if the Holy Ghost is going to speak, if they're separate persons, who's talking? Well, we have a trio singing. No, 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 no. 
No, because 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit, everybody say one Spirit. Are we all baptized into one body? Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. That one Spirit that dwells in us, He is Father, He's Son, He's Holy Ghost, He's Almighty God. He'll anoint you, hallelujah. All that is is manifestations. It's not persons. It's not persons, amen. And I've never had a Trinitarian give me an answer for that yet. They just, and I'm not being a smart aleck, but it's like a deer in the headlights. Because there is no answer except this one. Hallelujah. I'm glad for the Holy Ghost. Here's a good question. Who raised Jesus from the dead? Okay. In John 2.19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Verse 21 says, He spake, howbeit, of the temple of his body. So he said in three days, I'm going to raise this temple up, though you kill me at Calvary. All right, but in 1 Peter 1, 21, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So you might take him there. See now, in John 2, 19, it says Jesus is going to raise up a man himself. In 1 Peter 21, 1, 21, it says that God raised him up from the dead. So we would appear to say that was the Father. Romans 8, 11 But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, well, who dwells in us? We have the Holy Ghost. Okay? He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. So basically, Romans 8 and 11 says the Holy Ghost raised Him up from the dead. And John 2 says that He would raise Him up. And 1 Peter 1, 21, the Father raised Him up. So who raised Him up? The Spirit of God the flesh died and the spirit re-entered it. Woo! Raised him up. It's again, it's not three persons. It's not three persons. The, the, I, I, the doctrine of the Trinity does not make sense. But one God who is a spirit who robed himself in human flesh in order that he could be the propitiation for our sins, that's the beauty. That's the beauty. Now, who is visit me. All right. Who is the Father? John 1, 14. Who is Jesus' Father? Let's look at the birth of Jesus. 1 and 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we understand the Spirit overshadowed Mary. Amen. And raised Him up. I mean, and, 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 not, excuse me, raised him up. And, and she gave birth to the man Christ Jesus. So, he was begotten of the Father. Begotten of the Spirit, but the Father. John, excuse me, Matthew 1 and 20 says, But while he, this is Joseph, the espoused husband to Mary, thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So again, if the Holy Ghost is a separate person from the Father, then he's got two fathers. Because that which was conceived in her was of the Holy Ghost. And but if you say, well, but 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 the Father's the Father, right? The Father is the Spirit of Almighty God. These are, these are, na- these are titles. The, the doctrine of the Trinity, upon even a, a, a scant close inspection, falls to pieces. This is the only thing that makes sense. God is a Spirit, and He took on flesh through Mary's womb, and He was in the world, and the world was made by Him. It's the only thing that makes sense. Now, Ah, we got time. All right. I don't have to go longer either. I did cut out some things because I want to make sure I got to this. Now, Brother Godare told me this story. This is, 
He said there was a, a six foot two tall man. And, and he was teaching his little boy. His boy was six years old. He was teaching his six year old son how to shoot a basketball. And he said, son, it's like this. You hold the ball like this. Put it like that. Put your hand up there. You lift it above your head and you push it. You might want to put a little spin on it as you push it. And it goes up and, oh, he just put it right through the hoop. And then he'd show him again. Maybe he'd bounce off the backboard and go in the hoop. Might bounce off the rim, but he just kept doing it and showing it. He said, now, that's how you do it, son. So a six-year-old boy gets the ball holds it up. But he, he gives it his best shot. And it goes a couple of feet in the air. And boom. He said, put more oomph on it, son. Put more oomph on it. And so the boy, he gets it. So the dad just keeps showing him, keeps showing him. And the kid's giving it all he's worth. And, and he just, and, 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 and finally, finally, that little boy, he is so frustrated. And he says, that's easy for you to do up there. Here you are. You're, you're up there. It's easy for you to do up there. And I'm going to tell you something about God. I know that people, when we read the word of the Lord and hear about terms of righteousness and godliness, there's something about humanity, and we all know the stuff we're made of. And we think, God, that's easy for you to say up there. That's easy for you to talk to me about and to write to me about and to declare to me up there when you're surrounded by angels that are saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. It's easy for you up there, but I'm down here in the midst of the thieves and the robbers. And I'm encased in such human flesh. Amen. And the whole world lies in wickedness. And the, and the deceiver and the tempter, the wicked one, is going to and fro throughout the earth. That's easy for you to say up there. And he said, okay. I'll come down there. And he way up there but he came way down here and he behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he could be in all points tempted just like you and I but he did it without sin hallelujah it's easy for you to do up there I'm going to tell you we're talking about a neat God and a gracious God and a mighty God. And you think that he was... No, 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 no. You can go to places in the garden when he prayed, amen, as it were, great drops of blood, the humanity crying out to the divinity, the flesh crying out to the Spirit, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, not this flesh's will, but thy will be done. And he did, amen, the will of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Can I tell you something? He became a six-year-old boy, as it were, and he showed us how to shoot the baskets. Hallelujah. And we do grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, the message of the oneness of God is the most sublimely beautiful message in the Word of God. It's a beautiful message. I, I don't understand people tinkering with it and, and playing with it and, and wanting to scoot around it. It's beautiful. Embrace it. Love it. Live it. Pray for deeper revelation of it because it's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. Amen. And we'll take it a step further. And uh, I'd heard this, but I did look it up this morning. In 1921, there was a Dr. Evan O'Neill Kane, and he was one of he was the first promoter of local anesthesia. Now, 
prior to local anesthesia, say they're going to work on your tooth, the dentist, local anesthesia, they'll give you shots in that local area so that you will not feel pain there while they do whatever it is they have to do to your teeth or your jaw or whatever. If it's a root canal or pulling the tooth or putting in a filling or whatever, local anesthesia. And or if they have to put stitches into your hand or your thumb, they will shoot local anesthesia there. Well, prior to local anesthesia, they would uh, anesthetize when they finally come to place. You know, in, in the, like the Civil War, the Civil War, there was a million casualties. That means people that were hurt in the Civil War. Over 600,000 people died in the Civil War. And um, uh, almost, almost two-thirds, almost two-thirds of those that died, died of, of uh, disease or sickness or uh, and then actual, the rest of them were actually killed on the battlefields. Killed on the battlefields. So it was a horrible, horrible thing. And there was no anesthesia. If you had a gut shot and they were going to try and save your life, you'd have to, you'd ha unless, unless you were out cold, uh, you're going to feel everything as they dig around in you or in your leg or in your shoulder or in your arm. No anesthesia. Okay, when, when they got to a pl place where they realized that, that knocking a guy out, uh, such as uh, they would use uh, from the coca plant, cocaine. They would deaden up people with cocaine to lessen the pain. Uh, they would, they would uh, use laudanum or opium to the point they'd knock a person out completely and then do the surgery. Or they would use laughing gas. Now, laughing gas... Uh, and there's a, I'm going to say nitrous oxide, but I can't remember, so don't hold me to that. But in England, when they first, they come out with laughing gas, that's all they use it for. I mean, they, they, would, they would have uh, plays and dramas, and in between, uh, when they would have uh, uh, time out where people could rest and get something to drink, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in between, in portions of the production, they would have people come up and take laughing gas in front of everybody. And they would just laugh and laugh and laugh and fall and stumble around. And they did that for decades. They, people just use it. It was, it was like the pot of, of, of nowadays. People just, ha, 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 and kids would sit around, ha, 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 and growing up, ha, 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 with laughing gas. And then finally somebody realized it was a painkiller, and they started using it for dentistry, for dentistry. But, again, your whole body's berserk. Well, Dr. Kane... He said, no, 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 we can do better than that. And so he was coming up with local anesthesia. And he was, but nobody wanted to believe him. He had no patience, patient. He had, you know, the patients, the people he worked on. Nobody wanted to try it. They didn't want to try his local anesthesia. I mean, they wanted to, they wanted to be out. Doctors said, it sounds like a good idea, but we don't think it'll ever work. And he could not get anybody to buy in to the concept of local anesthesia. It just, it was going nowhere. And he knew it would work. So, he finally found a patient. He anesthetized him. Amen. Local anesthetic. And he performed an epidemy on him. He took out the man's appendix. Local anesthesia. He removed the man's Appendix, and everybody from that point on said, "Whoa, it works! This is cool." He never had another patient doubt. He never had another doctor doubt at all. Now, you know who the patient was? Himself. That's a bad dude. He gave himself local anesthetic and he cut himself open and he did his took out his own appendix with a, watching himself in a mirror he took out his own appendix and I'm sure he was laying down and the mirror was up but he cut himself open and he, he did it took it out 
sewed himself back up. And everybody was convinced. And they believed in local anesthesia. I'm going to tell you something about our great God and Savior. The sin problem was so bad. He said, I'm not sending another. His spirit overshadowed Mary. And in her womb, a child is born, a son is given. And he was born, and his name was called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. Amen. And in Isaiah, it says, it, pro- it pleased the Father. It pleased God to bruise him. His visage was marred more than any other. They made his back beat it till it looked like a plowed field. They, they ripped the hair from his face. They crowned him with a crown of thorns. But I'm going to tell you, he performed the surgery on himself. He came into the world that was made by him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, the oneness of God is the most sublimely, beautiful, wonderful message of the Bible. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. His glory said, I'll not give to another. So he performed the surgery on himself in order to get it done. Musicians come. I want us to stand. And here is my statement. Listen closely. There are those in these latter days that are wanting to tell people, amen, that that it's just a matter of semantics. It's just terminologies. It doesn't really mean anything. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. You're not selling that bill of goods. No, 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 no. At the name of Jesus, every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to swear. And we see one that is on the throne. It's not semantics, brother. It's the truth of Almighty God. Hallelujah. He's going to have a church called by His name, filled with His Spirit. Hallelujah. Walking in His ways and in His truth. And I, for one, thank God for it. Let's lift our hands and love Him. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus.